Um, happy Wednesday, everybody, and uh, welcome to the second webinar of the uh, um, PD Green and Global Freedom Fellowship series, um, organized in partnership by the PD Green program and uh, the Incarceration Nations of Latin America. This week, have, we also have an interpreter for this uh, for this webinar. Before I say anything else about what we are going to be talking about and introduce uh, the um, the uh, the panelists, I want to um, give our interpreter the chance to explain how to tune into the right channel for for everybody. So Inyaki, take. Thank you. Um, and uh, let's get going. So today we'll be talking about legal empowerment and global mass um, incarceration. We'll have a brief roundtable conversation with our uh, with our panelists. Uh, and then we will go straight on to some um, Q&A so we can hear um, thoughts, questions, uh, comments from, um, from, from the audience. Um, um, and again, when the time comes, uh, um, please feel free to um, ask any questions. Uh, we cannot um, um, we we cannot hear you, but uh, um, please use the um, use um, the chat to um, to to ask your questions and interact with uh, with us. We'll we'll monitor it. We'll uh, um, respond to some questions as we talk and uh, keep the others for um, for the final uh, for the final Q and A. Before we dive right into um, the topic at hand, I want to spend a couple of words introducing the uh, PD Green Program, which is our organization. Um, it's a US-based uh, Northeastern um, organization that supports uh, the academic goals of incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people through high quality volunteer tutoring programs, um, but also on the other hand, educates volunteers and the public on the injustice manifested in our carceral system. And part of the PD Green program is the Potcomer Center for Educational Justice and Equity, which uh, um, works on research on carceral and reentry education, really building on the PGP's expertise on its network of researchers, practitioners, advocates, while also centering the voices and the experiences of system impacted people. And for this, uh, for this series of webinars, we are delighted to partner with Incarceration Nations Network uh, and with their Global um, Freedom Fellows uh, who, are, um, who are here um, as, um, as, as panelists today. I will stop sharing. And so you can see our um, our faces. And I am Chiara Benetolo. I am uh, the executive director of the Potcomer Center for Educational Justice and, uh, um, and Equity. Um, and uh, in this role, I, I work on the PGP's uh, um, research strategies and on, uh, on piloting uh, and, and evaluating new, um, new programs. Before this, uh, I used to be a more traditional scholar and uh, started teaching in prisons, uh, couldn't stop uh, because I, I, was, I was too passionate about this work and uh, transitioned to, um, to PD Green. But much more interesting than me are our panelists. I'm going to very briefly introduce all of them, and but then I will ask them to um, introduce themselves more uh, more fully because I'm sure they are uh, much better at telling their stories uh, than um, that that I am. So. Uh, starting from um, Jody Polk, who is the founder of the Jailhouse Lawyers Initiative, housed at the NYU School of Law and the Legal Empowerment and Advocacy Hub. Um, like everybody else, uh, all, all of the other panelists, um, Jody is a Gro Global Freedom Fellow. She's also the recipient of the 2019 Peace Builder of the Year Award, the 2020 Martin Luther King's um, uh, 
Junior Legacy Award and named a Soros Justice Fellow in um, 2008. She's known for her work in Central Florida as an organizer on Amendment 4, which restored the right to vote for over a million Floridians with, uh, with felony convictions. After her, we have Kanan Kamu um, uh, I am going to butcher everybody's names. <laughs> I apologize for that in advance. And he is a lawyer and a social worker from um, Uganda, also a Global Freedom Fellow, and currently works uh, um, as a legal officer and a senior defender at Justice Defenders in Uganda, which is an international organization that trains paralegals and lawyers within prisons to provide legal services for themselves and their um, and their peers. Um, after we have Boxton um, Kutsiwe, a holder of a diploma in law from um, Pemba Staff Development Institute that is currently working with the Center for Human Rights, Education, Advice and um, Assistance. Uh, as the project coordinator of prison education uh, program, he targets uh, um, improving the livelihood for both incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people and their um, communities. Um, Maurice Cabiria is an LLB holder and a lawyer um, working as the legal education lead at Justice Defenders, a nonprofit education that educates and trains paralegals and lawyers uh, within correctional centers in Kenya, Uganda, and Gambia, including correctional officers, as well as incarcerated people, um, and trains them to provide legal services for themselves and their peers. And last but not least, we have Awande um, Shotana, who is a social justice activist, also holds an LLB from uh, um, the University of South Africa, and he is currently pursuing uh, um, his LLM in human rights law at the same college. He works for a nonprofit organization called People's Law, and he's a facilitator in a paralegal course that aims to make law more accessible to poor and working class communities. So as you can see, um, a whole wealth of knowledge and experiences with us uh, uh, with us today, and uh, a lot of uh, um, uh -huh. and a lot of uh, um, uh, lots of stories and uh, important work to share here. And so, I am going to. Um, Go ahead and start asking my uh, my questions. As I mentioned, uh, we will work um, on uh, a few um, few conversations uh, in a roundtable setting, and then uh, move on to a um, move on to a Q and A from uh, from the audience. And my first question is actually for you all to introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from, where you're currently located, what do you do, and why? What's your journey? How did you get to where you are um, here? Whoever wants to start, please feel free to start. So I guess I'll, I guess I'll start. So hello everyone, um, I'm Jody, and I am calling from the United States. I am a born and raised Floridian. However, I currently live inside of New York. And what we do at the Jailhouse Lawyers Initiative is we invest in the legal empowerment of incarcerated legal workers known as jailhouse lawyers as a tool to disrupt the cycle of incarceration inside of the U.S. And we do that through building out a national network of um, incarcerated jailhouse lawyers. To date, we have close to a thousand incarcerated members that make up every state inside of the United States. And we also partner with law schools. We call it a three strand core approach, which is a relationship between jailhouse lawyers, both incarcerated, formerly incarcerated lawyers, which also includes law students. Law students are so essential to the work that we do and institutions, um, specifically the institution of 
prisons, prison law libraries, and law schools. And so we partner with lawyers and law schools to connect to the prisons within their states and across the country to ensure that um, jailhouse lawyers have access to adequate legal education to be able to really meet the variety of legal needs that they are responding to with their communities on the inside. And in addition to moving resources and educations from law schools into prisons, we also co-create curriculum with law students and lawyers and jailhouse lawyers so that the legal education that we're providing for incarcerated individuals also is valuable to future lawyers and truly represents the needs of the communities. And we raise the visibility of jailhouse lawyers as essential members of the American legal ecosystem. We recognize that jailhouse lawyers within the prisons themselves have a closeness to our communities in a way that they're able to use legal empowerment as a tool to not just transform the law, but transform the lives of individuals and community members. And we seek out just pathways for incarcerated individuals to return our legal skills and experiences back to our communities, both during and after incarceration. And what has led me on this journey is I myself am a formerly incarcerated jailhouse lawyer. I worked in the law library during my incarceration inside of Florida. It was in prison the first time I ever learned the law and understood what the law was. And it was through my experience as a, a jailhouse lawyer that I was able to gain my own legal identity identity and to return home and to be able to have this opportunity to ensure that um, any isolated community have access and knowledge of the law in a way that they can participate in it, take ownership of it, but as well transform and shape it from the inside out. Thank you. Thank you. And I think I can already see a lot of the threads that we are going to be talking about today in terms of moving resources from institutions uh, um, to um, correctional facilities, but also moving uh, um, resources and knowledge uh, and, um, and, and people from correctional facilities to um, those established uh, um, higher education institutions. And one day I'm going to call you next uh, to go um to go next uh, just because you're next uh, to um to Jody on my screen. Um, so hi everyone. Uh, my name is Awande. I am from Cape Town, South Africa, uh, and the work that I do is also legal empowerment. I feel like when Jody was speaking, I was like, ah, oh, what can what else can I say? Um, but uh, very similar to what Jody is doing. Um, but for me, I studied and completed my LLB in incarceration. So I'm also a formerly incarcerated individual. Um, I studied uh, through the University of South Africa and completed my uh, degree during an incarceration. And now what I'm doing is I'm with People's Law. So what People's Law does is we focus on um, empowering communities with uh, empowering community leaders and activists with the basic knowledge of the law so that that uh, legal knowledge can impact their communities. So we look out for people who are active in their communities and leadership positions in organizations that are actively doing the work and what we do is we just give them a paralegal course so they could be community-based paralegals, uh, paralegals in the sense of they could give free legal advice to their communities and do referrals to lawyers. We have established a network of lawyers around Cape Town where the community-based paralegals could refer legal matters to those lawyers and assist their communities with an quicker and easier access to justice, um, which, and also very much focus not only access to justice, but access to legal education and knowledge. So People's Law does, uh, does that work and focuses on that work of empowering communities with paralegal skills. Thank you. Thank you. So important, this element of community building and, and community empowerment for, uh, for those. Mm -hmm. Boxton, could you go next? Welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. 
My name is Box Tenkuziwe, and I'm from Malawi, the southern part of Malawi. And my work station is Manza, the eastern part, the southeastern part of Malawi. And uh, I'm currently working as a, a paralegal on uh, access to justice and uh, prison education program. And uh, my law is just to uh, take uh, access to education uh, materials and uh, expertise into our uh, collection centers. You know, uh, Malawi has uh, almost three maximum uh, collection centers. So we are implementing this program in uh, the two maximum uh, collection centers. Uh, we are uh, encapsulated a uh, uh, trend on uh, skills development. Uh, and uh, so we do support for formal education in terms of uh, education materials and uh, access to uh, other uh, books and uh, some important materials. So uh, I developed this passion of uh, coming into uh, this work of uh, legal just because of uh, uh, injustice which I faced during my incarceration period. Uh, Malawi has a uh, high population and uh, comparing the population inside uh, collection facilities and the lawyers, uh, we have a very big gap whereby the paralegalism is the only way in to assist those who are in conflict uh, with the law. So uh, we also work on the uh, legal education program whereby we do go with uh, paralegal ed clinics or legal clinics inside uh, prisons or correction uh, facilities, uh, police holding cells and court holding cells. And uh, it is our routine to visit police holding cells almost every day just to uh, give the, legal, uh, the basics about legal and the uh, judicial system or court, uh, court procedures to those who are in conflict with the law, mainly those who are about to appear before a court of law. Thank you. Thank you. This element of providing access to education, supporting people who are working towards uh, towards their own right. All things will be uh, will be continuing to um, to explore. Um, and before that, let's let's hear from our last two panelists, uh, Maurice. Maybe you could go first, and Kanan, last but not least. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, my name is Maurice Caberia. I'm from Kenya. I work in Nairobi, uh, the capital town for Kenya. Um, I call myself a defender of justice and a social justice activist. Um, I am formerly uh, formerly incarcerated person, um, having served a death sentence in uh, our maximum prison here in Kenya, that is Kamiti Prison. Um, where I was from 2005 for 13 years to 2018. Um, it is at this prison that I met Justice Defenders. Then it was called the uh, Africa Prisons Project, we, where I work as the legal education lead. Um, Justice Defenders was is a movement um, of, from all walks of life. It was founded in 2007 as a 
non-profit uh, UK charity working across three African countries so far. That is Kenya, Uganda, and the Gambia. And we are a community of prisoners, prison officers, lawyers, judges, and allies. Um, we, we are likely companions working together uh, for justice to ensure that uh, people assess justice. We always say that some things can only be seen through eyes that have cried. So we work with defenseless communities to offer world-class law degrees, um, paralegal training, and free legal services to those who are indigent or defenseless. Our, our defenders are protecting the rights of these people to address the wrongs uh, which have been occasioned in their lives. Um, I also faced injustice in my life uh, when I've, I went to court and got convicted for an offense I did commit. I, and I believe that a disproportionate number, a disproportionate number of us um, who come into conflict with the law um, do so on account of being poor. People who may be unable to pay probably their rent and find themselves facing eviction. Uh, sometimes they are unable even to defend themselves in court. Um, other times they are falsely accused of a crime because they were unable to pay a bribe or protection money. Um, they face criminal behavior challenges on account of either addiction or mental health issues, which they have been unable to resolve. So once they come into prison, um, they lack the financial resources necessary to obtain proper legal representation or bail. As a result, they are most likely um, at prison sentences rather than non-custodial options. So they simply cannot afford to obtain a qualified person to legally represent them or defend them. Regardless of our status as justice defenders, and we here, all of us, and around the world, each of us should be protected by the law as well as become answerable uh, uh, to it. So we want to see people going from the margins of society to the center. Those who need justice most are least likely to gain access to it. And those who have the most um, to contribute for the justice systems, um, or rather those who have experienced for themselves at least uh, are the least likely to be heard. So international development is not just something that needs to be done mostly by white people to mostly poor black people or countries. They are, they are bright black people or colored people who have much to teach us. We are proud to showcase this radical aspiration and, and, and the black excellence. You know, we work to ensure the defenseless become defenders. So our work intentionally includes those who would consider themselves uh, or are considered by others as outsiders, marginalized or in conflict with the law. So these are the same defenders, the defenseless people we work with. I was once a defenseless person. I went to school while um, uh, incarcerated and I uh, joined the University of London Law Program, um, same course which was done by Nelson Mandela at Robben Island. And I, after doing my course, I was able to um, help change the Countries, uh, death uh, sentence, um, uh, uh, mandatory nature of the death sentence uh, to allow for anyone who has been uh, sentenced or rather facing a challenge for capital offenses to be sentenced to a proportionate sentence, you know, according to the kind of crime they had committed. It wasn't like that before. It changed uh, our jurisprudence in Kenya and it helped a lot of people. Um, who now can access justice, can get fair justice uh, in our quarters. Um, at Justice Defenders, we are working in prisons where we build legal offices inside prisons, uh, incarceration centers, uh, correction centers, um, and they are dropping uh, offices where anyone incarcerated at any time can be able to assess 
our office, get the services they require, legal advice, legal services. And we are working in, we are currently working in 18 prisons in Kenya. Um, in, in, in Uganda, we are in several prisons and also in Gambia. So um, it's an organization which is defending the deaf defenseless. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, and I really look forward to hearing more, uh, more about the amazing work that um, that you and and justice defenders are um, are doing. I do want to hear from Kanan um, before we um, we know we open up the the conversation to talking about the um, the work that you all are doing. Uh, um, Kanan, can you can you introduce yourself um, and your work briefly? Thank you. Um, they may need a minute. We will come back. Kanan, please write on the chat. Uh, if you, when you're, um, when you're back and, and ready to, um, to talk to us. Um, but in the meantime, uh, this is actually um, Morris. That great, uh, great segue to asking about uh, the the work that you all are um, are doing. And I want to ask, uh, why is legal emp empowerment uh, of people in prisons and jails uh, and formerly incarcerated people and their communities? Why is it so important and so needed? What are some of the barriers that people face uh, when they are fighting uh, for for their rights? So obviously, you mentioned economic barriers. Uh, um, what what is the gap that the movement uh, that you are are um, building is um, is 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 addressing? Well, uh, uh, due process is of doubtful value, uh, where um, someone is an illiterate or unable to understand court proceedings. Um, courts are next to worthless for people who cannot afford um, to, you know, to tell their story, the side of the story. So justice cannot be left to courts alone. So for these reasons, legal empowerment is crucial. Empowerment means that people are equal citizens. They are respected and confident uh, in their communities, you you can't empower. Um, you can empower someone. You can make someone empowered. You know, it, it's about ways of working and supporting someone. That means um, they can take control and responsibility of their own lives and on their of their own actions. And this is what we do because we open doors for people to be able to tell their story. Um, once they have been accused. Um, because we know already these challenges they are facing, literacy, um, lack of knowledge about legal issues, um, having not interacted with the, with the law in any way, um, we give them the opportunity to come to us, give their story, wherever they're coming from, whatever crime they have committed, and we help them to understand the court processes. We help them to learn and, and know how to defend themselves, how to address the courts, how, how, how to communicate with the court about their issues, because this is how they can be able to assess justice. You see, when one has been arrested and taken to any correctional center, for the first time, they get disoriented. They get, you know, they are always disadvantaged because the state has all the machinery um, to, to ensure that a conviction is attained because that's their target. But what you want to see in this world, you want to see everybody, including those who have committed offenses, be able to assess justice, get fair sentences, get fair punishment instead, um, instead of, uh, you know, being of abandoned by huge sentences just because they couldn't defend themselves. They couldn't talk about themselves, about their stories. And we believe legal empowerment, as we do, because we train paralegals, both uh, legal, I mean, uh, both um, incarcerated persons and also prison wonders, those officers who are guarding them. We take them together to a class, train them on, on, on law, legal issues, and they can be able now to help their colleagues in prison. 
help their colleagues inside those correctional centers. We go ahead and offer this uh, education by way of collaborating with the universities. We have collaborated with the University of London, uh, Strathmore University, Nairobi University, where we offer law degrees and law certificates to ensure that this person who feels the pinch of injustice now can be able to defend themselves. And most of the times we are able to translate or transform those people from being defenseless to becoming defenders of justice, defenders of the defenseless, just like me, I'm an example. I was a defenseless person, went through the program, got my LLB and today I'm defending people. Um, in the next few uh, months, I'm becoming an advocate, a barista in court, and I'll be able to represent people. So legal empowerment is important because it shows and it, it, it always ensures that access to justice can be available. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And, and you know, some of the barriers that you mentioned, there's, uh, there's obviously the element of uh, financial barriers, uh, there, there's literacy barriers, there's just the um, lack of knowledge of the law, because you've never needed necessarily to, um, to, to be familiar with that, of course, it's just such a, an unbalanced situation in which the state has um, all the power, because it's, uh, um, it's designed be um to be that way so wonderful to hear all the community building uh, that that you are doing uh, the the empowering of the community um to to turn defenseless people not just into people who can defend themselves uh, um, seems to me but also into people that can defend ad others uh, um and uh, um and build those communities inside correctional facilities uh, where people are supporting and helping and defending uh, um each other um Jody, one day boxing. Anything um to add on this um on this question of why is legal empowerment needed uh, for uh, for people who are incarcerated? Um, the only other thing I would add, I agree with everything that Morris said, is um the the fact that legal empowerment is rooted in human rights, and oftentimes we really don't get into this conversation and value of human rights inside the United States. We talk about criminal um, justice, you know, reform and abolition, but this um, this roots in human rights, as well as the legal empowerment cycle, that recognition of the fact that people have to know what the law is in order to use the law and become shapers and transformers of the law. And oftentimes there's this um, huge call for justice impacted people, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated people to vote, to participate you know, and shaping and transforming the law, or there's these narratives that we don't care because we don't participate in the law. So I've always valued that first prong of legal empowerment, recognizing that people have to know what the law is. And that doesn't mean you have to go to law school and become a lawyer, but you have to have an understanding of the law and see yourself um, and see yourself as a part of the law, but also understand how the law can be a tool for your own justice needs. And so I think that legal empowerment cycle in the, the human rights approach to legal empowerment is very essential as well as um, legal empowerment has been one of the few movements that I've seen where community organizing is also coupled alongside the law. Thank you, and I do want to return to that um, to that point of community organizing, and uh, um, you know, coupled with uh, with the law. Um, I wonder. I think you unmuted yourself. Uh, and... Yeah. Um, no, just uh, for me, uh, the importance of um, legal empowerment for incarcerated people is just bring it it bringing it into a South African context. Um, so, as you know, South Africa suffered apartheid and actually prisons were the tool to dismantle the liberation movement where thousands of uh, liberation fighters were sent to correctional uh, facilities and that's where they were kept silent and that system within correctional facilities was strengthened as a means of breaking people, uh, breaking the thoughts of freedom. And now South Africa, since they've attained freedom as a formerly incarcerated people, as a formerly incarcerated person, I feel that the system has not changed culturally. So even though we have a good constitution that affords us human rights, equality, 
uh, but within correctional officials, uh, within correctional centers in South Africa in particular, they still apply the same discriminative, oppressive systems of apartheid. Um, in 2022, I had the privilege of going to Robben Island uh, where Nelson Mandela was incarcerated. And there, as someone was incarcerated in South Africa, I just saw the same prison system that was applied in 1960, still being applied in 2020 in South Africa. So the legal empowerment for me is such an important uh, element for formerly incarcerated people to be, uh, once we uh, acknowledge or have that basic knowledge of how the law looked like in the past and how it looks like now with our new constitution, we can come up with new ways because formerly incarcerated people were never involved or are still not even involved in changing or shaping this narrative or being allowed, afforded a seat on the table uh, 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 as a means of empowerment in changing the system. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for sharing that that context about South Africa as well. And um, as, as as we know, um, the U in the US as well, uh, the, the carceral system, uh, the, the prison system, is has a long history and an ongoing history of being used as a tool for um, racism and racial discrimination. Um, so um, interesting, but also obviously, um, you know, uh, unhurting to see um, those uh, um, those those parallels across countries. So, um, Boxing, did you want to add something? I also wanted to um, dive a little bit deeper into this question of um, top top down, a legal system that is top down. Um, and uh, just because of how the law is framed and how the law is constructed, I've heard uh, from a few of you bringing up the question of, you know, it's a system in which the state has all the um all the um all the power and all the tools. Um, obviously the the law is created and then um top down uh, pushed onto um onto people and seems to me like uh, a key element of the notional legal empowerment is that it is a grassroots movement and that it cultivates communities. Um, and, uh, uh, and and applies a very different logic, uh, um, almost flip the hierarchy of the um, of of the criminal legal um, system. So, kind of injecting this question into our conversation around why is legal empowerment uh, um, important and what does it do? Seems to me this element of community is also something I'd I'd love to hear more of your thoughts on. Um, but before we go there, box in want to give you um, a chance to talk about this or um, the, the kind of the, the previous train of thought. Thank you. I wanted just to add on what my colleagues have alluded to, uh, but on the context of uh, Malawi, uh, you know, uh, Malawi illiteracy rate is about uh, 70, if not 80 percent of which majority who are in uh, correction facilities uh, uh, in uh, uh, problems with the knowledge of the law. So since our legal systems are from our colonial masters, they are always all our legal frameworks are in English, it is too hard for those who are in conflict with the law to understand the court procedures. So uh, sometimes they do face injustice just because they don't understand or where and how to respond to issues or allegations from the state. So uh, it is like the community or the legal empowerment is very important too mainly to incarcerated or formerly incarcerated just because it enables the the the, uh, the community or the incarcerated people to increase their control on their lives. You know, how the systems or the laws 
are treating those who are uh, once uh, suspected of committing offenses, who are answering charges, who are convicted. So it is a good tool to empower the community just because we will be able to stand on their own. They will be able to defend uh, their, uh, their lives. As we all know for sure that Ubuntu is the only thing which we need to promote uh, globally. Thank you. Thank you. Jody, I saw you um, nodding. Yes, absolutely. Because even, you know, when thinking about this, um, the impact, I remember when coming home, you know, from prison and you hear about the violence as well as you feel the violence of institutions and systems in your body. And when joining the social justice movement and, you know, it's like the system is bad. Um, these institutions are bad, but one of the things that I have recognized throughout my years now of being home and doing um, this organizing is that when you go into institutions and systems that there is oftentimes some really good people right within these systems. And what I've seen is that incarceration isn't just limited to um, the communities that I've lived in. I see so many lawyers incarcerated inside of the courtroom. I see judges incarcerated into the narratives in the old ways of ways things that have um, have been and really seeing how a lot of times like individuals within these top heavy systems are also very isolated and controlled by the narratives and just the generational cycle of the way that they have been. And so I'm really excited to see how legal empowerment can not only decarcerate, you know, poor people or people of color, um, isolated people, but how it also decarcerates um, this top down and bottom, you know, approach. And I think one of the most exciting things as Awande was saying was that when um, justice impacted, justice living people are a part of new processes, we get to see fresh, new, creative, innovative ideas that have been just generationally um, left out. When I think about the incarcerated um, jailhouse lawyers that are right into the JLI on a consistent basis, although many of them are serving life in prison, many of them have faced injustice, you know, inside of the system. What we bring to it is this um, resilience. We bring to it, you know, this sense of community. Community. I'm thinking about the paralegals at Justice Defenders. They embody, you know, peace building from within prisons. And um, we need to see, you know, a, a vision of what hope, you know, and what community and laughter and brotherhood and sisterhood and what that looks like. In, in my personal um, experience, I saw more examples of community in the women's prison women with life sentences that came, you know, next to me as a young person in the system and loved on me and taught me and, you know, really model authenticity to me. And so I recognize that that to me is one of the greatest implications of um, legal empowerment and closing this gap between the bottom and the top is that it really brings us into relationships that can um, transform cultures and transform generational old ways of doing things. I like to tell folks we're in the age of Aquarius. And so we should be expecting to see um, things that we have never seen before. And I think legal empowerment um, is definitely a, a space where we can um, imagine as well as like abolition, right? This radical imagination of what can be versus what has been. And I'm excited to see what it looks like when we are also, in addition to um, justice living people participating, when we're humanizing the lawyer, when we're humanizing the judge, when we're humanizing um, some of these, you know, powerful actors to remember that you are also a part of community. You are a mother, a brother, a community member. And when we tap into our identity and we see how our diversity can, you know, um, really be a strength and we can see power and privilege is not a devalue, but we can bring our power and privilege and different experiences to the table. It actually gives us more to work with. 
Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Love that idea that um, everybody needs to be um, to be liberated one way or, or another. The system needs to be um, liberated and radically rethought um, rather than just giving people tools to fight within the system. Um, there is the, the, the work that is out there to be done is um, is much more broader, much more radical and much more of a work of um, of imagination. Um, on that note, uh, Morris, I wanted to ask you, I think your organization, if I um, heard you correctly, also works with correctional officers inside uh, inside prisons. Um, that as, as the PD Green program is something that we have thought um, about doing a lot, we don't currently do, uh, but it's something we periodically discuss. Should we be providing um, education? Should we be supporting correctional officers who are um, going to college as well? Because that is a population that is impacted by the criminal legal system in very different ways from those who are incarcerated, but nonetheless is often trapped in similar, um, not, not in similar, but is also um, in need uh, uh, in need of liberation. So, um, Maurice, could you tell us a bit more about what's that experience of working with correctional officers? And I think you mentioned judges as well as incarcerated people. Yeah, thank you, uh, Sierra. Um, yes, we probably can say from my own experience because when I was sentenced to death and went to death row. Um, there, of course, there are, there are sections where uh, uh, incarcerated people are taken to where they live, their, 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 their residences. So uh, inside there, I found a very rough life, always running away from officers, uh, correction officers, fightings, you know, riots, all kind of things. There was no peace. You know, it was cumbersome and uh, you know you couldn't imagine that you could survive in that environment but um, when I was introduced to the law program and went to um, the prison academy to study I found a totally different environment a very peaceful environment and for the first time since my time in prison I realized I was rather so uh, um, correctional officers sitting together on one table with in, an incarcerated person and several of them, and they were discussing and, you know, learning, trying to discuss legal issues together, um, you know, studying together. And there was a lot of peace in that, in that class. This showed me, and actually it is a clear picture of what happens when um, you, train both correction officers and incarcerated persons together. One thing I know in Western countries, it's, it's an ad of, and you know, most of the times they keep a distance. You don't even come nearer to a correction officer as an, as an incarcerated person. So how can you sit in one class and really study together? It helps a lot in creating peace within the community. The, 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 the correctional center community. It helps a lot because it, it they engage and you can be able to, you know, uh, share ideas, share stories, share problems, even challenges which we are facing. I can share my challenges with, with the correctional officer and they could come of and be, become um, helpful to me. Today, I find correctional officers going to court to represent the people they have escorted to court, the same incarcerated people they are escorting to court. And they start in before a judge and they, you know, they talk on their behalf because probably the person doesn't even understand the, the, the court language or probably the, it's, it's an old man who cannot, you know, uh, be able to even um, explain themselves. It helps them to, um, you know, understand, we help them to understand the legal, um, concept and can be able now to represent people. The impact of um, having correction officers studying together, working together as paralegals, as jailhouse lawyers, together with um, uh, with incarcerated persons is, is there to be seen and it's big. And that's why even judges now got interested and wanted to know what's happening. You know, these days I can see 
a prison officer coming to court and representing an inmate. And, and, and they, they wanted to learn more and that's how they were introduced to our, our, our programs. And today we work together with them. We have committees, we meet uh, regularly, discuss issues which we fight inside the correctional centers and which we think can be solved through um, a dialogue, through uh, such collaborations and they have helped a lot. Before there was a problem in Kenya where um, somebody, an accused person could not be able to get um, disclosures, maybe uh, statements of witnesses, maybe even understand why they're in, in, in before the court. They don't even know their charges well. But today, because of that collaboration between us and the prosecution and the police and the judges, uh, who are all unlikely allies, uh, we, we are able now to have um, a system whereby we can be able to ask for such documents and they are availed in prison and they can help someone to defend themselves. This way we have we've been able to reduce even the congestion in prisons because sometimes when someone goes through the statements, they just need to go and tell their story and that's all and the case is over because surely they probably there was no evidence against them. But before they had to go through the process for years before they were confirmed to um, be innocent or not to have a case to answer. So I would encourage, because I know this can happen in any other country around the globe. I would encourage all of us to um, maybe try and learn our model and implement it in your own uh, um, incarceration cent uh, correctional centers, where now you will see for yourself the difference between having um, um, the correctional officers and incarcerated persons, persons as, 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 as antagonists. This time they become friends, they become allies and they work together towards uh, the goal of assessing justice. And it is, uh, it is possible and it can happen. Thank you, thank you, absolutely. That's a, that's a wonderful example to hear. I know there are a few um, cases in the U.S. I think of of uh, um, education happening jointly, but this is uh, this is really remarkable, and it sounds like you are um, achieving incredible success through uh, through this collaboration. So thank you for sharing that with us. And uh, you mentioned um, kind of that 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 this. Uh, uh, the structure that you built um, uh, came from learning from your own experience uh, of uh, working on your case while you are incarcerated, which uh, um, leads me to my last question before we open it up to um, uh, to the audience to hear from uh, from them and their questions. I know we already have some questions, um, but I wanted to ask uh, uh, a few of you and we'll mention uh, um, studying law or being a jailhouse lawyer while you were um, incarcerated, even starting to work on your degree while you were incarcerated. So can you tell us a bit more about uh, that experience? Uh, um, what were the challenges uh, that you faced uh, with um, um, uh, defending yourselves, studying the law, getting to know the law? What were your successes, uh, of which I know there are many? Um, Awande, I saw you unmute yourself, so please go first. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you so much, um, uh, Kiara. Um, so my, my uh, personal experience of studying in incarceration, especially uh, studying law, was that um, it was actually motivated by uh, the lawyer that represented me in my uh, case uh, during court. Uh, it didn't motivate me in the positive sense. Uh, that motivation was in the uh, with a negative connotation. The day I received my sentence to imprisonment, uh, my own lawyer that represented me said to me, I will never become a lawyer. I will never become a judge. I'll never become a policeman. The only thing that I can do in a court of law is to interpret. Um, and then I can never study law. So the moment that I heard that I can study law, uh, I I was so motivated to show that lawyer that look here, yeah, this thing can happen, <laughs> and and then that experience in itself, uh, being incarcerated as a very young uh, person, I was uh, I went into correctional services 
uh, as a teenager um, and growing and growing myself and exploring uh, 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 different concepts, learning from different people, as Jody was saying, you know, getting people who are wise, uh, you, you, you know, in, during incarceration, you go in um, as this person with this dark, heavy burden on you, and then you end up meeting friends and then you leave that uh, place as, as a family. And I think with also the Incarceration Nations Network, we've with Maurice Boxton and Jody, we've built that family uh, component and we're able to collaborate in these spaces. And so studying law was such an amazing journey that it uh, enabled me to be able to participate very uh, 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 in different stages, if I can say, and also increase my confidence as an individual. Um, I grew up, I feel like I grew up in understanding law and that law shaped the character that I am today. Um, so the virtue of understanding law and its exclusiveness, unfortunately, in all parts of society, in uh, exclusive in Kenya, it's exclusive in the US, it's exclusive in Malawi, it's exclusive in South Africa. So it's so exclusive to the fact that it really is expensive to even to study law and the lack of access of it. And we were privileged enough. And that privilege, I think the work that I'm doing now, facilitating the paralegal uh, uh, course with people's law, I actually started it in prison, you know? Um, I, 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 I was one of the few people who were studying law and people would always ask me, what does this mean? What does this mean? So I had to always explain these complex legal issues in a simple language that people could understand in my home language and also in English. And that has enabled me to ease to be a much more reachable and accessible facilitator when I understand and explain law to someone else. And I think that experience trained me so much that I even participated in the Ubuntu learning community. Uh, while we were still incarcerated, we had a moot court challenge where we acted as lawyers uh, in a courtroom and we were wearing our orange uh, prison uniform and on top of that, we were wearing our robes as attorneys or lawyers or advocates. And there's such a contrast picture uh, to see for someone who's currently incarcerated to be like, okay, what's going on here? Underneath, I'm seeing a different color, but on top of that, I'm seeing this esteemed uh, uh, individual. So that experience really shaped how, when I got released, uh, my confidence and and the drive that I have to empower communities, formerly incarcerated people, everyone with just the basic knowledge of the law. And I'm so passionate about the work that I'm doing with the paralegal work um, that I'm able to see the impact of how the participants we work with, the activists, the formerly incarcerated people that I've interacted with, the impact that the program has. And, and through uh, uh, studying law, uh, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was invited to be a guest lecturer at the University of Stellenbosch, where uh, it was third year law students in the new module, Criminal Justice in Action. And I was sharing my personal lived experience of the law as a lay person, someone who did not understand the law at all. And how that contrast played out when I was studying law and just referring back to my court case, I was like, oh, actually we could have done this, we could have done that and highlighting that to the students to say, this is actually how law can work in practice. And here are the, 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 the gaps in the system through my personal story. And that really for me was, was, was such an inspiring moment and the students actually saying and having that positive feedback from them saying, wow, they've, they've now seen criminal justice with a different lens because they've met someone with the lived experience, someone who understands the law afterwards and someone who's using the law as a tool of change to empower communities and in better and, 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 and actually change the system uh, slowly but surely. Yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thank you so much.
Thank you, thank you. And really great to see um, and very important to see um, higher education institutions, institutions of power, um, opening up and hearing the um, experiences and the strength and the knowledge, the wealth of experience that people um, who are formerly incarcerated like you um, have. Um, I, I think we have time for a couple more uh, responses on this. I do want to um, open it up to um, to the questions from the audience as well. But anyone else wants to chime in, share more of their story? Jody? Um, I, I'll say because for me, my experience was a little different. I got free in prison. I had I was long incarcerated before I got to prison. I was incarcerated in the school system, incarcerated you know, inside of my body. And I remember I never imagined I would be a law clerk, a jailhouse lawyer, because most of the people who were the women were all serving life sentences. I had an eight year sentence. I probably had the least amount of time, but it was actually a civilian law library supervisor that kept watching me. And she requested that I go into the law clerk program and train inside of the law. And I'll never forget, um, because I, I did commit my crimes, all of them, I did them. And it was sitting on the floor of the law library that, of reading the elements of the crimes that I had committed because I did not participate. I pled out, did not participate in the pretrial um, portion of um, my, my court's you know, issue. And it was on the floor in the law library as a law clerk learning the law that I understood why I was sentenced, that my sentence was just, and I just understood what had happened and understanding that I had received a just sentence and why the state had accused me of these crimes. It actually allowed me to say, you know what, I'm going to do my time and work on myself in a way that um, I didn't carry the guilt and the weight, right, of the mistakes that I had made, the choices that I had made. And so, like what Amanda was saying, I think one of the, the motivations for me as a, a jailhouse lawyer was translating that law into a language that my sisters could understand. Um, I think it's really hard oftentimes for law clerks, people serving life sentences, doing all of this legal work for individuals and not having that help you know, for themselves, but having a, a short sentence and, you know, having this um, curiosity and excitement around the law really empowered me to um, give it away to women, you know, in a way that it wasn't me telling them what the law was, but helping them to understand that law so that they could then formulate their own arguments as well as being a law clerk gave me access to youthful offenders. I was also the law clerk to women on death row, women in closed confinement, in addition to women who are a part of general population and listening to their legal stories, uh, much like what the Global Freedom Fellowship did of like positioning me as a part of the world having these conversations with women as a jailhouse lawyer gave me an understanding of how similar our stories were, how, you know, common these pathways into the justice system really was. And it gave us this opportunity to really think about how the law that persecuted us could be also the same laws that we use to liberate ourselves. Um, digging through the incarcerated manual for the manual for incarcerated parents. And I'll never forget learning that, oh my, we have rights as parents, as incarcerated people, and then telling as many people as I could and seeing women start to get visitation rights. Seeing women participate, you know, inside of family um, law issues was just really um, powerful. And so just recognizing, again, that the position of the jailhouse lawyer within the, the, the um, prison is can be a powerful and a very privileged position to have access to those who are oftentimes locked away on the inside and to really demystify this language of the law into something that we can tie back to our experiences, but also um, see how systematic, right, the law really is in a way that we don't um, personalize it or wear it in a way where it's all, you know, it's my fault or um, it's because of me, but to really see these harmful systems in the way that they are and trace it to um, the pathways that led us into incarceration so that in addition to challenging um, our sentence, we can also return home in a way that we can challenge these unjust and violent systems that um, can allow us to prevent even participating in the justice system altogether. 
Thank you. Thank you. And and I really love how several of you at this point have mentioned this question of translating. It's a big process of translation of, um, of the law um, to a language that uh, is um, more plainly understood by people and also maybe translating people's um, lives into the framework that makes sense within that, um, that, that legislation, right? Um, thank you. I do want to ask one of the questions that we got from um, from the audience. If you do have other questions, please put them in the Q and A. The chat is not enabled for uh, for the audience, so if you write anything in the chat, we cannot uh, um, we cannot um, we cannot see it. So please use the the Q and A function. Um, and the first question that we have uh, is, thank you for this truly really brilliant conversation. I agree. Thank you. Uh, and how do you see legal empowerment operating across borders? How are you all collaborating transnationally? Which I think it's a great question um, because you all are uh, obviously part of the Incarceration Nations Network. Um, and also because we have seen um, some, some remarkable intersections between the ways in which criminal legal systems work in um in different countries so please take it away um maybe to answer that one um the first answer i could give is talk to the dr buzz incarcerated nations network you'll know how this can work um one one thing um i came to learn last year in 2023 when i joined the uh, uh, global freedom fellows fellowship is that as jody said we all pass through the same things in different countries different continents no the same system is operating because largely you find that uh, the law has been framed in a such in, a, in such a way that it criminalizes illiteracy, it criminalizes poverty, you know, it criminalizes um, lack of knowledge. Sometimes people just end up being convicted because they did not get that opportunity to understand even what the changes were exactly, and law is framed in legal language and legal language is so difficult for a layman and we need to have laws framed in plain english or plain languages including um, um, local languages such that people can be able to understand what is happening that's why you hear almost everyone talking about um, um, interpretation because Law is all about interpretation. It's a law which has been put in place by, by legislators and it is interpreted in court. Uh, when I'm charged in court, the judge interprets that law to find me guilty or not guilty. So it's about interpretation. Now, how do you really uh, defend yourself if you don't know even how to interpret? Um, the challenge you're facing. And this is the problem we are having. And we're having it across the countries. And the way we are here today is an example of how we can operate across the borders. There is nothing stopping us. You know, it's, it's an utopian idea to bring borders in this world. I don't believe in borders, you know, Kenya bouldering some other countries. No, what for? We are all human beings. We all live the same life. We are all serving the same you know, purpose of life. And so we, we can be able to um, uh, interact and help each other across the borders because the same problems we have, especially the criminal justice system, is the same problem we have, which is also being, um, you know, you know you can find in, in, in the Western countries, in the Eastern countries, um, just like you find them in Africa. So what we do is we identify areas where we have some similarities and we can be able to export um, the solutions which we find in a certain country to another country. You know, like in, with us in uh, the Global uh, GFF, Global Freedom Fellowship, we interact together, different people from different countries, and then we learned that, oh, it's just the same thing I was passing through in my cell, uh, just 
the same thing someone in Netherlands was passing through, someone in the United States was passing through. And then we came up with the programs to collaborate between ourselves so that we can be able to advocate for um, better um, rehabilitation uh, programs, better reintegration programs, reentry programs, better um, you know, collaboration in, in terms of legal issues. And this is what we are doing. Jody here is organizing a very um, um, you know, noble idea of, of, of having paralegals from outside becoming, you know, from inside becoming, uh, having a voice at the outside, you know, there are silent voices inside the correction centers. They have, they know, they have ideas. They know how such problems can be sorted out, but their voices are never heard. So what can we do to have these voices be heard? It's something like what you are doing today, Chera, and it's something um, uh, which we are doing as GFF, as a family, and thanks to Incarceration, uh, incarceration, incarceration Nations Network for this uh, great program which they brought here. And I know what I believe in the next few years, this question will be practically answered. Whatever the, um, the person asking the question is from, he will get to hear and learn practically when he sees us there trying to change some of these uh, punitive um, uh, systematic laws which are in place in each of our countries. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have, I'm going to, uh, we have a few, several more questions, but I want to go on to at least one of them. Uh, that is, uh, how did studying law in prison impact your understanding of the criminal um, legal system? Um, I know Jody, you started talking about it. I'm really curious to hear from the others' uh, perspectives as well. How um, what how did that change? Um, so studying law in prison um, for me it uh, for 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 my fellow incarcerated people I was like a a, a knowledge resource. And then for the correctional officials, it's kind of like I became a, a, a challenge because I would always raise like, or even the uh, uh, working as a paralegal, writing letters on behalf of other uh, incarcerated people with a lot of legal jargon. I have the right to access one, two, three, and everyone would know, would be aware that, oh, you are assisted by so-and-so. Uh, they think they are lawyers, they are not lawyers. So there was that challenge of, um, and I think that's where justice defenders actually uh, 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 has like the cherry on top and the solution of actually empowering together the correctional officials with, uh, 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 um, with incarcerated people. Because in South Africa, we don't have that. And I think that's where the huge gap is. And that's where now the 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 strain of of uh, um, correctional officials not understanding the power and the change that comes with education, not only for the incarcerated person but also for themselves as well. But as also Jody was saying, uh, within correctional officials, they are those good people. So I had champions while I was studying who really supported me, who who would be able to uh, get me the law textbooks that I needed, who would be able to get me the information, the assignments, the submitting of assignments in time, writing my exams in time. Um, so studying in prison was both uh, a very, very challenging because of the environment and understanding that it's, it's higher education is not accessible, it's very exclusive. So, that exclusivity has led to people not understanding its importance. And, 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 and we, I, myself, uh, while I was studying, I tried my utmost best to get as much more people who, who wanted to further their studies within, uh, 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 wanted to go to college, uh, helping them with registration, helping them to understand what do you need, how can you access certain documents. So... Um, it was so empowering. I, I feel like the studying in correctional uh, or in confinement 
was the springboard to my success while I'm uh, uh, while I'm outside because most of the information and the way that I pursued uh, my legal career within is how am I pursuing now my legal career on the outside. Um, so that experience has really, really, really helped me. And my lived experience of understanding the law is, is so different. Um, even with the attorneys and advocates that I'm working with, they're always uh, 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 intrigued on how I tend to understand the law and the people because I was the person who was also part of a judgment. So I always bring the aspect of lived experience. It's so important in whatever legal matter we are involved in. The lived experience of the people must come first and our legal interpretation can work afterwards. So, so yeah, it, 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 it was really, really, really empowering. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I love how your question, your, your answer to the question, how did um, studying the law change your understanding of the criminal legal system? You explained that, but then you also explained how living um, impacted by the criminal legal system changed your understanding of that of that system. And why is it so it is so important to um, keep that lived experience uh, um, front and center in um, in the conversation? Um, if anyone else wants to chime in on this question, we have a few more minutes. We also have a few more minutes for one more question from the audience, if anyone else is uh, um, so inclined. I wanted to respond to the first question around the how we're kind of coming um, together. In 2018, when I won the Soros Justice Fellowship, um, there, that was actually when I learned about Alexander McLean and it was the African Prisons Project at the time. And I remember being so inspired. It was felt like a, a small dream to imagine uh, people becoming certified paralegals while they were incarcerated and to learn that people were becoming lawyers um, inside of Africa in this relationship between um, the University of London and community-based organizations. And I must say, Alexander McLean and Justice Defenders have become such a huge part of uh, my vision and just that magic of what we can achieve. And very excited to see that relationship and that model come into the United States, as well as um, all of us, the Jailhouse Lawyers Initiative, as well as nine other global organizations who are specifically working with um, incarcerated paralegals, CREA, justice defenders. We formalized an international incarcerated paralegals Congress, the IIPC. And so it is very much inside of its infancy phase, but collective global organizations are coming together to really build out this Congress of incarcerated workers to shape the narratives, to be a part of the conversations, to participate specifically also in policy, not just shaping and using the law from incarcerated but shaping and using some of these larger laws. And I must say, I'm excited to see what Awande does for um, men serving life sentences that has a desire to learn the law in South Africa, in Cape Town. And so to, in addition to seeing how we um, all experience some of the same challenges, we're learning from these various models and incorporating them as well as we are globally coming together to create spaces um, not for just us, us as formerly incarcerated people, but for our incarcerated brothers and sisters who are still inside to also participate. And it's just truly an honor um, to have the Global Freedom Fellowship. The application is now open for 2025. I'm excited to see more U.S. Um, individuals as well to tap into not just the models of work that's happening globally, but that community and that value of family that I have only, uh, I don't want to say only, but mostly see um, outside of the United States and how do we bring that back into um, the United States? So that was something that I just wanted to um, to name. Thank you, thank you. And uh, actually perfect segue to going back to some of the, um, to, to our organizations and to the Global Freedom Fellowship, the, um, the PD Green Program. Uh, uh, I want to put in the, oh yes, I can put them in the chat. I'm putting in the chat the um, links to, um, is that the right link? Um, to Incarceration Net, uh, Nations um, Network uh, and uh, to, um, to the website 
of the PD Green program in case anybody is um is interested in uh, um in learning more about those two um those two organizations uh, panelists uh, please feel free to put in the chat the um the links for your own organizations I'm sure that people are are interested in hearing uh, um where they can learn more how they can um support uh, what can they do if they want to get involved so please feel free to put um in the chat your um your own uh, your own links um i see them uh oh jody are i think uh, if you yes you're i'm gonna share it to everyone just make sure you're sharing it to everyone not just to the host and panelists and um just wrapping up our our conversation Thank you again for for participating, for sharing your experiences. Uh, I think uh, we all learned so much about um, how the criminal legal system works and does its work uh, uh, marginalizing and disempowering people, but also how uh, people are working to um, empower themselves uh, and uh, and their um, and their communities. Uh, um, taking this bottom-up approach and building community um, in response uh, to the uh, to a system that is uh, designed uh, to, um, to 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 marginalize and uh, um, and oppress people and disintegrate communities. So thank you for sharing your experiences, your lived experience. It's always uh, um, really really important and um, and interesting to um, to hear. Um, and. Uh, as I was talking, we got one more question um, that I think I'm. I, yeah, I'm just going to um, leave for um, for people to um, to to read and uh, and mull over because it's a it's a very broad question that I don't think we'll have the chance to um, to answer in the next uh, um, in the next five minutes. Uh, if you like this webinar. We have a few more coming up, and uh, I'm going to go back and share um share my screen again. Here you go. So um if you're interested in supporting the PD Green program, of course, please uh, please do. Also, please uh, support the, the organizations of the um and of, of, of our panelists, as well as Incarceration Nations Network. Uh, um, a couple of events that we have coming up that I want to make sure are on everybody's radar. Um, as the PD Green program on September 26th in Philadelphia and everywhere virtually, we will have Going Green, our annual gala. Um, where we will be talking about um, art that is made inside and outside carceral facilities. And then on November 12th, so in a few months, um, always at 12.30 p.m. East, uh, we will have the next webinar of the um of the uh, of the series uh, bringing together the PD Green program, the Podcomer Center for Educational Justice and Equity, Incarceration Nation Network, the Global Freedom Fellows. Uh, um, it will be devoted to incarceration and global mass incarceration. We actually started talking about education uh, during during this uh, this webinar already. Hearing about um, what kind of education people are bringing inside correctional facilities, but also what kind of education is coming from correctional facilities on to the um, outside world. So really look forward to. Um, uh, you know, um, continuing the the conversation around that uh, um, that topic with, uh, and I I hope to see some of you um, some of you there on November twelfth as well. Please stay tuned for uh, for more details on registrations, etc. I think yes, um, just in time. I'm going to wrap this up. I don't want to have the final word. So, uh, panelists, uh, any final words, final thoughts, um, um, anything that you want to leave our um our audience with. Um, well, oh, sorry. <laughs> good, good, good. <laughs> 
Uh, just on my side, thank you for everyone that attended and allowed us to share our lived experience and our understanding of the legal system and how law changed our lives and also changing the lives of our communities, country, continent, and the world, because I think the goal here from this panel is to have global impact. And uh, through the small uh, communal impact that we have, I think together we can then, through collaborations, create that wider global impact through paralegal education and knowledge of the law. So thank you all for coming and hope to see you in other webinars. Thank you. Well, just just to echo Awande's um, sentiments, yeah, thank you so much for all the participants for turning up. Um, it's good to hear this, um, um, you know, discussion and um, engagement because it's true that law belongs to all of us. Initially, I also thought that law was about the legislators, law was about the government, the police, you know, but law is for everyone. It's for all of us. We live with law in everything we do everywhere. You go to a shop to buy something, you're engaging yourself in law. And you need to know these things. You need to know uh, your rights. You need to understand how you can be able to um, um, interact with the law to avoid you know, facing injustice because injustice anywhere, as they say, is injustice everywhere. So um, I, I encourage you to um, join these programs by Petty Green because they are very educative and they are informative for you. And you can be able to learn some few things which can help you. And you are welcome to engage any of us here and to find out more about what you do because we are here to advocate for um, fairness, justice, and to ensure that all of us in this globe um, enjoy our peace. Thank you so much and welcome again. Let's meet in the next webinar. Thank you, thank you. On that note, wonderful conclusion. Um, we will let everybody go. Thank you again for joining our webinar and we look forward to seeing you on November 12th. Thank you.